Thanks everyone so much for joining us here today uh, for our Policing State Policy 101 session. We are so glad that you were able uh, to join us. And I'm gonna take a minute to introduce my colleagues who are also on the call. But while I do that, I want to know who we have on the call. So if you could please drop your name, where you're from in the chat, that would be so great. I saw we already started off with somebody from Texas. Welcome from Texas. Uh, we are here from Colorado and DC. So we're looking forward to spending some time with you as we go forward. And with that, I want to introduce my colleagues who are also on uh, this training session with me. I have with me Susan Frederick, who is Senior Federal Affairs Counsel in our Washington DC office. And also my colleague, Zach Herman, who is a policy associate in our Denver, Colorado office. Uh, and he works with our employment, labor, and retirement team and helps us out with the employment issues from the law enforcement uh, side of things. And my name is Amber Widry, and I work for our criminal justice program here in our Denver office. Uh, together, we are part of our team at NCSL that works on policing policy issues. Uh, for those of you who might be a little bit new to NCSL, I just want to briefly state that NCSL is a bipartisan membership organization for all state lawmakers and legislative staff in all 50 states and the territories. And we are so glad to have you here with us. I was just going to scan and see. It looks like we have everyone joining. Uh, quick housekeeping for those of you who may be trying to post where you're from in the chat. Just a quick note, if you get the spinny circle for chat, uh, refresh your screen. If that doesn't work, the Q&A feature should be working. So know that you can still uh, type your questions in the Q&A feature, but try refreshing that screen if you're getting that continuous loading circle uh, for the chat function. Refreshing seems to have worked for me and hopefully it will work for you as well, or hopefully it is seamlessly working for you already. So with that, I want to jump right into our content for today. Zach, if you could switch us to the next slide. I wanna paint just first a big picture for policing policy and talk a little bit about additionally the state role of legislatures in policing policy. Uh, generally, the role for state legislatures has been somewhat limited. State laws are certainly playing a role and have played a role in policing policy, but historically policing policy is managed either by the uh, local jurisdictions, cities, counties, and local law enforcement departments themselves, or it's managed at the by federal courts um, taking action after an incident has taken place. And we're going to talk today a little bit about the federal role, the local role, and then we'll spend time after that talking about the role of state legislatures and how it's evolved over time and recent changes that are in place for that role. So to start off, my colleague Susan is going to tell us a little bit about the role played by the federal government. Susan? Thanks, Amber. So while, as Amber mentioned, policing generally falls within the purview of localities and to some extent the states, the federal government does play a role uh, in policing issues. And I wanted to point out on this slide that it, it infiltrates kind of all three branches of federal government. You have Congress, uh, the president, and then the judicial branch vis-a-vis -vis the Supreme Court and the federal circuits. So Congress lately has acted in two ways. They have substantive legislation, which we saw in the last Congress, and criminal justice funding streams, which states can use for policing purposes. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the legislation first and then get into the funding streams for those of you who might not be familiar with federal funding to states in policing and criminal justice areas. So with respect to the legislation, the House passed a bill back in the summer after the murder of George Floyd. It went through the full House. The Senate also introduced a version. You see the bill numbers up there on the screen. That bill in the Senate did not pass the chamber, so it died on the vine, so to speak, at the end of the 116th Congress. How will these bills impact states? We fully expect one or more bills to be put forward, probably initiating in the House again on policing reform and accountability. And some of the main features of actually uh, the House bill and to a lesser extent the Senate bill would require the development of policing best practices, either by the Attorney General of the United States or the COPS office, which is the Office of Community Oriented Policing Services. Uh, with stakeholder input incorporated into that premise. The House bill and to a lesser extent, the Senate bill required the use of reporting, use of force reporting to the federal government. 
either, either to the Department of Justice or to the FBI. The House bill wanted that reported to the DOJ, the Senate bill to the Federal Bureau of Investigations, FBI. The bills establish a federal registry for police misconduct. So there would be a federal requirement as well uh, that would pass down to the states. Enhanced officer training and conditioning of criminal justice grant funding on compliance with a lot of these standards that were put forward in the legislation. So that would entail uh, either preemptions of state law or unfunded federal mandates if there was a cost involved. The bills restrict the use to some extent of no-knock warrants and the use of chokeholds. And the compliance again would be tied to the federal funding that states receive uh, with respect to criminal justice uh, authorities. Dash cams and body cameras requirement are in both bills uh, and also federal funding would be tied to compliance there as well. So this federal funding that I keep referencing in the congressional legislation, what is all of this? So the biggest funding stream that states receive is the burn JAG funding. And this is very flexible funding that states can use for over 20 purpose areas. And they just need to be able in your state to tie the purpose area back to some sort of aspect of criminal justice. So policing, uh, law enforcement uses are all acceptable under this burn JAG formula funding grant. Um, the COPS fund, which is the only criminal justice direct funding stream that goes right to the localities, bypasses the states. This is for COPS hiring and COPS training. And that is something that would be involved with policing issues as well. SCAP, which is the State Criminal Alien Assistance Program, is not a grant. It is a reimbursement program that uh, is entitled, it is uh, informed to reimburse states for incarcerating criminal aliens in their state prisons and jails. Currently, we don't get a whole lot back on our efforts for that. It's about 17 cents to every dollar that states spend, but we we put it in here because it is a stream of, of money that does come to states, even if it's in a reduced capacity. And then the Second Chance Act, which is used by states for reentry programs. Uh, again, this funding would also be in hit or curtailed if compliance with federal law did not happen at the state level, should any of the congressional legislation pass. Um, moving over to the executive branch. The president uh, has the authority by executive order to provide guidance language to the Department of Justice and to law enforcement in general on goals for policing. So under former President Trump, there was an executive order that he issued over the summer directing the Attorney General of the United States to identify and develop training opportunities for law enforcement to handle situations where mental illness, homelessness, and addiction are present. The um, current president, President Biden, has also put in his platform in his first 100 days a very uh, broad category of achieving racial justice and racial equity, which includes policing issues. And we have not seen legislation or further direction there, but we, we certainly expect to over the next several months. And then moving to the last category, which is the federal judiciary, most uh, notably the Supreme Court. The issue that comes up in the judicial branch related to policing is that of qualified immunity in section 1983. So section 1983 litigation applies to all state and local government employees, including the police and most notably uh, and, and most numerously to the police. We usually see these types of cases coming up in the law enforcement and policing context and it would make them personally liable for money damages if they violate a person's constitutional or statutory rights. Q, uh, qualified immunity or QI as I'll refer, refer to it colloquially is a limited defense to a section 1983 action. And while it's available to all state and local government employees, it is primarily used by police officers in this type of litigation. So the question then becomes is will the federal legislation or will the president uh, provide guidance seeking to modify or remove qualified immunity in the law enforcement context. Uh, we don't know the answer to that just yet, but I will say that um, qualified immunity not only applies to law enforcement, as I mentioned earlier, it applies to any government employee. So even outside of the law enforcement context, uh, if the qualified immunity doctrine is not specifically 
related to law enforcement, it would apply across the board. And now I will turn it back over to Zach to talk more about state issues and policing. Thanks so much, Susan. I'll just jump in quickly before Zach kicks us off to talk a little bit about the local role in policing and ask if you're just joining us, drop, drop your name in the chat and tell us where you're from, what state you're joining us from. And with that, I'll hand it over to Zach to tell us a little bit about the uh, role of local government and agencies in policing. Take it away, Zach. Thank you so much, Amber and Susan. Um, so sort of a, a brief way of understanding this, the federal government sets the broad sort of direction, the states add more direction, and then the local government is where the more direct hands-on sort of day-to-day -day regulation of policing happens. Um, so that happens through two ways, both the political subdivisions, so the cities and counties, and the law enforcement agencies themselves. Um, so cities and counties will appropriate budgets for both sheriffs, police officer departments, um, and, and things like that. And they'll also put oversight mechanisms in place, such as civilian oversight boards. Um, the powers of those civilian oversight boards can vary significantly from just review boards to, like in the case of Chicago, uh, full authority to make disciplinary decisions. Um, uh, political subdivisions are also where the bulk of the data collection that we're seeing is happening as well. Law enforcement agencies will then adopt policies and procedures based on state, uh, uh, federal, state post boards, police officer standards and training boards, and those local regulatory decisions. Um, and then from there, they can adopt above those regulations or at those regulations, they can't go below. Um, they can also control internal investigations and procedures, and they set hiring and employment policy, and they also do their own internal de uh, data collection. Um, and then I'll turn that back over to Amber to talk about the state side. Uh, thanks so much, Zach. Uh, now that we've heard a little bit about the federal role in policing policy and also the local role in policing policy, we're going to pivot and talk a little bit more about the role for states and in particular state law and state lawmakers. Um, so first I want to talk by uh, highlighting sort of the state of policing and policing policy at the state level prior to 2014. At that time, state statutory regulation was fairly limited and what was codified generally reflected federal court rulings or had to do with the authorization and funding for state policing agencies, such as state bureaus of investigation or highway patrol. National events, starting with the death of Michael Brown in late 2014 in Ferguson, Missouri, really had a big impact on expanding the state role, with state lawmakers addressing policy at the state level in ways that they really previously had not done prior to 2014. The recommendations of the 21st Century Policing Task Force, which was short, formed uh, shortly after the death of Michael Brown in Missouri, uh, really had an impact in driving the, what new trends we saw in state legislatures. Some of those trends included community policing and funding for new community policing programs, state standards and mechanisms for investigating use of force incidents, expanded and generally new data collection requirements for use of force incidents, and also stop data collection, uh, looking at focusing on collecting demographic information related to traffic stops to counter um, bias or um, profiling actions. Uh, we also saw increased support for crisis intervention training for officers um, and state involvement in supporting new local alternative law enforcement responses, recognizing the sort of diverse set of duties that we ask law enforcement to perform that may go beyond sort of what we think about when we think about law enforcement, which is basic enforcement of the law. They respond to a lot of varying situations, and there was an increased interest following 2014 and helping better equip them to respond to those situations. We also saw um, what was particularly notable is the adoption of new technology and state regulation of new technology. We saw new state guidelines for the use of body cameras that address storage requirements, how they're used, and also public access to footage. Um, and then we did see one state, South Carolina, putting in place um, a sort of mandate for the use of body cameras at the state and local level, but all of that was conditioned on funding. So in 2020, national events again changed the way that state lawmakers approach policing policy. We saw a really a, a tremendous surge of legislation after the death of George Floyd in May. And it's particularly notable how much legislation and particularly the number of enactments that we saw because legislatures normally would not have been in session in late 2020. But as we all know, 2020 was not a normal year and COVID-19 session delays and special sessions to address budget issues and other COVID-19 related issues 
really provided lawmakers with a unique opportunity to respond to policing policy issues late in 2020 sessions. Some of those actions were immediate and there was some pretty comprehensive legislation that came through at the end of 2020 sessions. But we also um, saw setting up the infrastructure to continue this work in 2020 as well with new task forces, study commissions being put in place to make recommendations for 2021 and 2022 sessions. So Zach, if you could go to the next slide, please. I wanna start by highlighting one of the ways that I hope that NCSL can be helpful to all of you who have joined us for this call. And the first is by highlighting that NCSL launched a new legislation tracker in the May of last year, 2020, to help our members uh, keep updated on what other states are doing to approach this issue. So the hyperlink is here, but you'll also see it in the chat. My excellent colleague, Amanda, is dropping some resources in the chat for all of you. Um, and you can use this tool to take a look back at legislation in 2020, but you can also use it to track legislation going forward in 2021 sessions. We've started adding some of that legislation to the 2021 tracker, but you'll really see us ramping up some of that tracking in the next couple of weeks as more bills are being introduced in the states. Uh, so now I just want to do a couple of quick things. The first is we have a poll question for you. Um, we are curious, how many bills do you think that legislatures introduced between May and December in 2020? We want you to put your guess for these questions in the chat. And I'll give everyone a minute to navigate over to the chat. A quick reminder, if you get that spinning sort of continuous loading circle, just hit refresh. Hopefully your chat should refresh. Um, I also want to remind everyone at this point too, as we really get into start talking about some of the state trends and legislation going forward, um, you can use the Q&A section of the interface. You can ask your questions there. You can upvote questions. We'll be addressing questions at the end of our session and at the end of our overview. Um, so please, if you have questions as they come up, certainly put them there. That way other folks can see them and upvote them if they have the same question that you do. And I'm just looking to see if there's any guesses in the chat. Not seeing any guesses on my end yet, but I can only see part of uh, the chat from my end. So I will go ahead and move on and give you the answer, which is that between May and the end of last year, 36 states and Washington, D.C. introduced more than 700 new pieces of legislation, with nearly 100 of those pieces of legislation being enacted by the end of 2020. As I mentioned previously, the volume of legislation here is really just notable because of the way that 2020 sessions worked out. Um, it's notable because policing policy as a whole in previous years hasn't really represented this large of a share of legislation that's made um, really notable progress, but it's also notable because as I mentioned, legislatures normally would not have been in session during this timing um, in 2020. So Zach, if you can advance to that next slide. Of those nearly 100 new enactments that we saw in the second half of 2020, it represents the actions of just over half the states. Um, there were a number of trends in this legislation and we're gonna get into those, uh, but I really wanna say that on the whole, most of the trends that we've seen have a lot to do with law enforcement accountability. That's really sort of the top line trend that we saw in 2020. And we expect that to continue into 2021 sessions as well. But there's also some diverse other issues that are cropping up in 2021. So Zach, if you could advance to the next slide. So eight states in late 2020 enacted legislation that would require tracking of various aspects of police community interactions. There have been a number of approaches in the states uh, related and using data, but I just want to give you a couple of examples. The Colorado law requires creation of a public database to share on use of force topics. New York passed two laws, one requiring reporting uh, for law enforcement agencies within the agency, and the second requiring that data to be reported to both the legislature and the governor. Vermont and Nebraska both had laws on the books that already require data collection. The new provisions in those two states require or condition uh, grant funds on participation with those data requirements. Um, Minnesota also has a slightly different approach, which is it requires that departments report data to the federal government, specifically the FBI, and that's in addition to reporting their new data to the State Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. 
Related to this, 10 states have also created study committees or other state oversight mechanisms to review the existing data and information available and make recommendations on policy going forward or to monitor implementation of recent enactments. That was the case in Vermont. They implemented both new policy, but also a mechanism for oversight to um, ensure that implementation uh, goes smoothly going forward and also really monitor any needs for um, other legislative actions related to policing policy going forward. Related to oversight, states also enacted laws in 2020 to promote independent in investigation and prosecution of misconduct and use of force incidents. California, Connecticut, Colorado, Iowa, Minnesota, New York, and Virginia all recently authorized state officials, usually the state attorney general um, or a division of the State Department of Justice, to investigate or prosecute officer-involved offenses. Uh, notable here is that both the Colorado and the Virginia Attorney Generals within their new investigation powers have also been empowered to investigate and pursue civil pattern and practice suits. You'll notice that Nevada is the only state that I haven't mentioned that you see on the map there. Uh, they already had in place some existing regulations for investigation of use of force incidents, and they modified those regulations uh, to be more in line with sort of emerging practices, um, but it didn't necessarily empower a state level oversight for investigation. There has also been a focus on setting new standards. Zach, if you go to the next slide. New standards and requirements for use of force and with a particular focus on deadly force. We had 14 states with new laws in the second half of 2020. Colorado, Connecticut, Oregon, Virginia, and Vermont are probably the broadest in terms of their statutory guidance to officers on use of force. All of those listed on the map, except for Hawaii, addressed neck restraints and chokeholds in some manner, with some states prohibiting the maneuvers altogether and the others relegating the use of the maneuvers to when deadly force would otherwise be authorized. Um, in terms of the Colorado, Connecticut, Oregon, Virginia, and Vermont laws, they're really setting a state standard for use of force and creating state level guidance for officers when it comes to use of force. Um, traditionally, this is something, as Zach mentioned, that would have been handled by department level policy at the local level, uh, but the increased focus is now creating a statewide standard. So as you know, citizens of the state go from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, uh, the expectation is the same across the entirety of a state as opposed to having uh, very hyper localized standards when it comes to use of force. Related to these new standards and restrictions, states have also addressed requirements for law enforcement misconduct when it occurs. There are several states who have codified new affirmative statutory duties to intervene in situations where um, excessive force has occurred or when an individual's civil rights are otherwise being violated. Uh, in the, some instances, states have also created duties to report that same conduct for an individual officer or a superior. A couple of things to note about these laws is um, it usually applies not only to individual officers, but it also applies to officers who are observing superior conduct, so they have to intervene even if the person who's acting is their superior. Um, and related to that, recognizing that law enforcement officers giving them this duty to intervene puts them potentially somewhat at risk. Some laws have specified or created prohibitions against retaliation or discipline when an officer does intervene or report such incidents. Um, and failure to intervene in some states can result in dismissal or disciplinary action. Uh, and then I want to talk a little bit about legal duties and liabilities beyond just these duties to intervene and duty to report uh, excessive force and violation of civil rights. I want to talk a little bit more about um, state actions once a violation of civil rights has occurred. As Susan mentioned earlier, uh, usually this has traditionally been handled at the federal level through Section 1983 litigation. And that applies to not only to law enforcement, but also to all state and local government actors. So we've seen sort of a new interest in creating state parallel uh, causes of action for violation of civil rights. Both Colorado and Connecticut have new parallel 1983 statutes, essentially. They are, however, specific to law enforcement actions and don't cover broader state actors. Um, and they are specific to instances when law enforcement officers violate an individual uh, an individual's civil rights. So both laws do limit the use of governmental immunity acts. 
And then the Colorado law also specifically limits the use of the qualified immunity doctrine as a defense to these new state civil actions. And Susan talked a little bit about that. Um, it's important to note that it's a judicial doctrine, but the Colorado law specifically names it in statute as not being an applicable defense to this new civil action. Um, in addition, there's sort of one final legal obligation or legal duty that I want to mention that states have taken action to address, which is that at least four states, Colorado, New York, Nevada, and Virginia, have all created a duty to provide medical assistance or to offer aid to individuals in an officer's custody. Um, the circumstances when that duty applies to an officer varies. It usually is only when the individual is in the officer's custody and after um, use of force has been, it's been necessary to use use of force, the officer is then um, obligated to check in on the medical condition and needs of an individual who's in their care at that point in time. And with that, I want to pass it over to my team member, Zach, who's going to talk a little bit about the law enforcement employment issues uh, that have been addressed by legislatures in 2020. So thanks, Zach. Thank you so much, Amber. So states have also addressed various law, enforcement, law enforcement issues related to training, certification requirements, decertification guidance, and disciplinary procedures. Most of the new training requirements were related to equity and use of force, with states requiring de-escalation training and training of new use of force standards or regular bias reduction training or other training aimed at reducing racial profiling. States have also banned warrior style training and training on the use of neck restraints. Um, there's also been an ongoing and now increased interest in crisis intervention training and related alternative law enforcement responses. Uh, there's an interest prior, this was an interest prior to 2020, but state attention to alternative and non-law enforcement responses has certainly increased and we expect to see this continue in 2021. Most of the new certification laws are related to new screenings, including behavioral, psychological, or bias-related screenings. Massachusetts, Massachusetts is also not listed on this map because the law was enacted very recently, but notable for requiring the creation of new statewide certification standards for law enforcement officers. States have also enacted laws that address decertification and discipline, with some of them providing broader access to certification information. Both the Colorado and Oregon laws require the creation of a statewide decertification database that is publicly accessible. The only other states, such as other states such as New Jersey and New York, lifted confidentiality provisions, but stopped short of public databases and disclosure. Colorado, Connecticut, Iowa, New Mexico, and Oregon all address statutory guidance on which uh, on when a state agency can or must revoke an officer's license. Uh, and then for 2020, we also, for the first time, are seeing the broad statewide mandates for body camera use by all law enforcement officers. Colorado, Connecticut, and New Mexico require the use of all, require use for all officers statewide, and New York and Vermont require adoption by state police forces. Other new laws were less novel, such as continuing or changing state regulations for the use of body cameras, including storage and accessibility of footage. And I will then hand this over to back to my colleague Amber to talk about sort of the other issues that we have. Thank you so much, Zach. Um, I want to first start by posing a question to our participants and the audience, and then I'll wrap up with what's on this final slide here for 2020. I'm curious now that we've discussed the trends from 2020, what our attendees are seeing as issues that are coming up in their state. So let us know by dropping in uh, the chat, what the issue is that's being addressed in your state in 2021, if it's something new that you haven't seen in our 2020 presentation, or if you're seeing sort of more of the same of the trends that started in 2020 and are continuing in your state in 2021. So respond in the chat and I'll let you guys have a minute to sort of put those things in the chat while I cover briefly uh, this last slide. I just wanted to mention that Zach and I provided just a really a very high level overview of some of the trends that we saw in 2020, but it's certainly not a comprehensive overview of state interests uh, that we saw in 2020. And these are some of the other sort of peripheral issues that we saw come up. They're listed out on this slide here. Uh, so I just wanted to highlight some of those. In case you had interest, you can certainly find legislation that's relevant to each of these topics in our legislation database that we had the link to earlier. Um, or Amanda, if you're there, if you wanna you know, highlight that link, certainly you can drop that back in the chat. Um, but mostly we're curious now to hear from you where state interest lies in 2021 and the amount and kinds of things that you've seen in your state. 
So I want to just give a little bit of time because we um, certainly as a membership organization here at NCSL are interested in uh, what the trends are in the states because we try to tailor our resources and our research to you know those topics that are best there to serve you. So I'm curious to hear uh, what some of the trends are in the state and I will check the chat to see if some of those responses are starting to come in. In the meantime, Zach and Susan, while I'm waiting for individuals to drop in their responses into the chat, is there anything that you've seen in 2021 at the federal level, Susan, where there's interest in this issue? Uh, not so far, Amber. You know, the Congress has just gotten itself reorganized. The Senate has finally negotiated a power sharing agreement a little less than a week ago. So right now where the focus is, is naming members to the various committees for policing issues. Uh, these issues would fall within the jurisdiction of both the House and the Senate Judiciary Committees, and then they have subcommittees on crime and criminal justice. So we are awaiting to see where they're going to go with any legislation. But I will say this, the trend federally has been, you know, once a bill has passed a chamber, so in this instance, I would be referring to the House of Representatives, that's probably where any future legislation in this particular Congress would start, uh, both in terms of content and with respect to the chamber of origin. That's great information, Susan. Thank you. And while I'm waiting for other folks to chime in to legislation they've seen in the chat, Zach, I know you testified last week um, on one of the issues that's been of interest in the states. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. So I uh, testified in Delaware recently about training and its connection to certification and decertification, um, which I seems like a big issue in a lot of a lot of the states right now, sort of tying all of those things together. Um, and then on top of that, where sort of civilian oversight boards can come into that uh, process, sort of before a police officer can even formally be employed as a police officer, they have to get the certification. Um, and how are states thinking about regulating that across the board? What are the base requirements? Are those requirements enough? Um, and then do we need civilians in that process as well? What's that sort of effect? So I'm seeing an increasing trend on that level of sort of examining that and the state having a more active role in regulating. Awesome. Thanks, Zach. I know training has definitely been of interest in other states. Uh, I testified a couple of times earlier in 2020 in Oklahoma, and that's one of the issues that they were studying there. Um, I also know that uh, Illinois was one of these sort of early states out front. They were in session right away, and they had a huge, I think it's like 750 page bill that's been through both chambers and I think is still awaiting signature from the governor at this point, um, but addressing a number of the issues that we've talked about here today already, in addition to addressing some pretrial reform issues as well. And it looks like um, we have a response from Pennsylvania. They passed legislation to create a database that law enforcement agencies are required to check when hiring law enforcement officers that's intended to keep records of officers that are fired. We are seeing legislative proposals surrounding the use of force policies and civilian oversight. Thanks so much for sharing that with us, Jake. I think that that's something that we're seeing in other states. Certainly, Zach, I know that you and I have had a conversation about seeing a lot more civilian oversight legislation than what we maybe anticipated seeing going into the 2021 sessions. Um, and some of those disciplinary, uh, whether it's like Colorado, Oregon, having those public facing databases, if not going that far, there's certainly interest in some states in um, at least creating mechanisms for agencies, law enforcement agencies within the state to converse with one another. Sometimes that's like New York lifting the confidentiality provisions or um, other states just really sort of requiring those open lines of communications between agencies. All right, perfect. So I think we will go ahead and move on. And with that, I want to also note one of the sort of next resources that is really the first of its kind here at NCSL. It is the statutory law enforcement database. And what we've done by creating this resource is really try to create a state of the states or provide lawmakers and legislative staff with a baseline 
for where uh, legislative and state level policy related to law enforcement stands currently. And so Zach, I'm gonna ask you to go to NCSL's homepage and we're sort of gonna walk through how do you find this resource? How can you use it? What does that look like? So this is the homepage of NCSL's website. And if you click on that top uh, bar research tab, there's a drop down, as you can see, Zach's navigating over there now. You're gonna see a listing of topics. One of those topics is civil and criminal justice. So you can click there. And I may be seeing a delay on my end, Zach, nothing's loading. Okay, perfect. <laughs> I will exercise some patience then. Perfect, there we go. And you'll see that this is sort of the first resource that pops up on this page. Whatever's trending or hot or sort of issues that we're getting a lot of questions about, if we have resources that are available to you, we try to highlight those here at the top of the page. But on the left-hand page, you'll see that sort of stacked sandwich. You can search all of NCSL's resources and documents sort of by topic heading. So you'll notice we have a law enforcement portal there as well. Um, you can open that and you can explore other law enforcement and policing resources. But for now, Zach, why don't you just go ahead and click on that law enforcement statutory database and we'll take a quick tour. So first I wanna highlight that the database currently has nine active policy sections that are available to you. We do have three that are coming soon. We have community oversight that's coming soon. We'll have some information on collective bargaining. And we're also gonna have information on law enforcement officers bill of rights. Those are all coming soon in the next couple of weeks. Currently though, however, we have information on use of force standards, which is one of the trends from 2020. So we'll have that 2020 updated information here. Use of force investigation uh, standards, whether that's creating a state level attorney general oversight mechanism or requirements for local agency investigations. We have information on statutory training. We have information on legal duties and liabilities. This includes all of those, um, you know, duty to intervene, duty to report, a lot of that information. We also have an overview of qualified immunity. There isn't a 50 state sort of um, tool or feature associated with the qualified immunity section since it's only been addressed in really a small handful of states, but that's certainly outlined in the overview once we click through. And then we also address use of force data collection mechanisms in the state. There's a pretty diverse array of approaches in the state. So this really gives you the ability to compare and contrast use of force data collection um, mechanisms in the states. We also um, talk about some of the law enforcement uh, employment pieces, which is certification requirements in all 50 states, what's required for law enforcement officers to maintain certification, and does a state actually require certification? Sometimes it's not a state requirement and it's managed at the local level. We also have information on statutory guidance on decertification. A lot of this is managed by state post boards or state agencies, but when statutory uh, guidance does exist, we've cataloged that here. We also have information on traffic stop data. I mentioned earlier, this was a strategy that emerged in 2014 to address profiling. And so we do have some of that information here. Zach, if you wanna select one of the uh, profiles, I'll show you what it looks like once we click in. So Zach has clicked on our use of force standards uh, uh, interface. So once you're in the database, you're gonna see a couple of things here. The first is that there's the um, database interface, which is that picture at the top. Once you click into that, you're gonna get more information. But Zach, I'm gonna ask you to come back to that in just a second. So the first thing you're gonna see is the statutory summary. This is where we give you sort of the, the top line, the state of the states. We break down everything in the database for you to give you information about sort of what other states do. What do the majority of states do? Are there any particularly unique aspects of this area of state law. We break that down for you in the statutory summary. If you scroll down, Zach, you'll see that we also have a section on using the database. Some of the important things here are the, we convey the parameters for what the database does and does not include. Um, you'll notice that we specifically state that the database is only statutory. We're not including uh, state regulations, agency guidance. We're not including local policies. The database is specific to state statutory um, codified law. So that's important to note because sometimes states will say, oh, you know, I noticed we weren't included in the database or why isn't this provision there? Uh, one of the limitations of the database is that it only includes statutory provisions. It doesn't include other sorts of um, sources of law from the states or the local level. Uh, so that's important to note when using the database. 
We also, if there are relevant additional resources, we'll list those at the bottom. If you have resources from your state that you think are particularly interesting, you'll see my email is attached to each one of these pages. Or feel free, if you think that we've missed a statutory provision in your state, absolutely email me. Uh, we always wanna make sure that our information is as up-to-date and accurate as it can be. So Zach, if you wanna go ahead and go back and click into the database, we'll talk a little bit about how to navigate the database itself. So there are a couple ways that you can navigate. You'll notice that the default here is to show um, all of the states highlighted in yellow if they have a statutory provision on the books. You can also search by uh, just clicking on, let's say, Alaska and taking a look at what their provision is. So Zach can select just Alaska. You can do this either by selecting Alaska under filter by state, or you can click on the state on the map itself and it, the database will react interactively. You're then going to see in that bottom section of the database every statutory provision from Alaska that's specific to statutory use of force standards is going to populate. You're going to see the excerpts of the statutory language itself, a citation, and also the state name. Now, something that maybe is not quite as intuitive is if I want to look in multiple states, I simply hold down the control key on my keyboard and I can select, say, Alaska, Arizona, Arkansas, California by holding down that control button as I select multiple filters. That's going to work for our topic search as well. So just keep that in mind that you can use the control key to uh, select multiple things when using filters. Um, Zach, if I wanted to refresh the database and get rid of all the filters that I've applied, you can just hit the refresh button at the top of the page. The other way that you can filter through the database is to look by subtopic. So obviously we've already sorted the database interfaces down into topics. We're currently looking at the use of force standards topic. But now I can look a little bit deeper and drill down and look at say just deadly force, or I can look at statutory regulation of less lethal force, or I can look at neck restraints, specifically the 15 states that have taken action um, on that, or I guess it's 15 states in 2020, there's maybe a couple before that. So that's another way that you can utilize the database. The final way that I think the database might be most useful for some of you is to do the text search. And Zach, can you actually go back out to the main interface and pull up training if you don't mind? So one of the questions that we commonly get at NCSL is how many states require training for law enforcement officers on interactions with individuals who have autism. And so one of the ways that the text feature is going to be helpful is if you're looking for something that's so specific, Zach, if you just type autism in there and hit search, it's gonna pull every state uh, training requirement that is statutorily required that specifically addresses autism. Um, and so if you're looking for something that's more specific than what's in the topic search filters, certainly use this summary text search to drill down further into the states. And you'll see that the map, map is going to populate and reflect the states that have provisions, but you're also going to see the statutory language uh, populated in that chart below. Um, with that, I think that I've explored the database. If you have questions, certainly drop it in the Q&A portion. I'm happy to talk about the database or happy to talk about law enforcement policy uh, in general. But thanks so much, Zach, for going through the database with us. I now want to um, pitch it over to Susan to talk a little bit about NCSL's role at the federal level and ways that our members can get involved. So Susan. Thanks, Amber. So as you know, uh, now we have a very extensive state research arm, uh, which is housed in our Denver office. I work in our Washington DC office, which is our federal advocacy office. And we do have a way for you all to get involved with the approval of your leadership, which is to join our law, criminal justice and public safety committee uh, and our policy working group. So what does that mean? Well, we are able to lobby on behalf of states before Congress and the administration based on our member driven policy positions on all issues related to criminal justice, not just policing. So if you want to peruse our, our website there, you can see um, some of the areas where we have enacted policy. And I'll just briefly go over our policy process so that you all can get a sense of how that works. So much in the way that you will have committee meetings and votes on, on positions on bills in your states, we do the same thing at NCSL. So the committee will have a policy that is member driven, again, generated by our membership on member from the committee. And we will hash it out in committee here at NCSL. 
and it will then go to the general membership of our organization when we meet uh, as a group, which is twice a year, once at our legislative summit in the summer or at our capital forum in the late fall, early winter. So there's two opportunities to pass policy. Those are the two meetings where that happens. And in order for this to become a, an official policy of NCSL, the entire membership of the organization has to vote uh, in favor of it by three fourths vote of the states. So that is one way you can become involved. We use these policies which are directed at the federal government, not at other states. We don't tell other states what to do. We only tell the federal government what to do or what not to do. So we will have these policies in place. If it's a policy directive, which is a longstanding policy, it does not expire. We amend them from time to time based on things that the federal government or Congress or the Department of Justice is considering, whether it's favorable or unfavorable to states. Most of our policies are based on issues that uh, would entail preemption of state law, where states have established a body of, of law, either statutorily or through state courts that we don't want touched, or if the federal legislation or regulation would impose a significant cost shift or unfunded federal mandate on, on states. So that's kind of our, our general frame of reference. And uh, this year, we fully anticipate that the Law, Criminal Justice, and Public Safety Committee will be taking up policing issues. We do not currently have policy in that area. We feel it is ripe for activity, given the, um, the actions of the federal government, particularly Congress, in working with policing legislation. So we do intend to take that up this year and uh, hope that you all will come to our meetings. Hopefully, we'll be doing those in person soon enough and be a part of our pro uh, policymaking process. And I will stop now and turn it back over to Amber for our next segment of the program. Thank you so much, Susan. Um, I just want to remind folks that if you have questions, feel free to drop that in the Q&A section of the interface. You sort of have to toggle over from chat to see the Q&A session. So um, I should have highlighted that early on. But I just wanted to briefly cover uh, while those of you who may have questions have a chance to submit them, uh, that NCSL is uh, really here to serve you, our members. And we love hearing from our members. And so you'll see on the slides there, Zach is sharing our uh, contact information. Um, I work on the criminal justice team and can help with some of those issues. Susan covers federal affairs and can help with any of the federal components. And then Zach, as I mentioned previously, works for our employment, labor, and retirement team. But feel free to reach out to any one of us. We really do approach this issue uh, as a team. and would really love to hear from you and you know, help you or provide assistance or research if we can or are able. Um, we also mentioned testimony earlier. That's another service that NCSL can provide uh, upon request or ask from a committee chair or other leadership in the state. Uh, we can certainly come out and provide um, 50 state information and insight on various policy areas, not just policing, but others as well. So I have at least one question that has come through here, and I want to um, pose this one to Zach. How are states funding training and or what are state, st state strategies to support rural law enforcement uh, to get access to training? Thank you, Amber. Um, so we don't know of any sort of direct state strategies to fund rural law enforcement training. Um, that may be a topic that comes up in 2021 in legislation, but otherwise we're not seeing sort of any direct programs yet. Um, and most of the training is funded if it's statutory, if it's statutorily required is through direct appropriations um, to the to the offices, usually through local local programs. And departments. Thanks so much, Zach. The other question that I saw uh, pop up in the chat here is, are states defining what entails or defining neck restraint or chokehold? Um, and I will answer that one. The answer is no, <laughs> and sometimes. Um, on the whole, generally states are using very broad and general language by saying that certain neck restraints or uh, chokeholds are prohibited or relegated to when deadly force would otherwise be um, 
authorized by law. And we've seen some states sort of broadly and statutorily define what qualifies as a chokehold. But for those of you who may be former law enforcement officers who or who um, have been more involved in law enforcement training on a more intimate level, certainly we're, we're not seeing statutory definitions that are so specific as to break down uh, carotid holds or various sort of respiratory restraints. It's not that explicit or specific. It tends to be much broader language. Um, the other question that we have here is, have states created data dashboards that are publicly available? Zach, do you know of anything on that front before I chime in? Yeah, so the two ones that stand out the biggest to me are Colorado and Connecticut's decertification dashboards. So those are statewide for any police officer who's been decertified, um, and those are publicly available as well. Perfect. That's kind of what I was going to mention, Zach. There's those decertification databases. That's sort of a new and recent um, development. But I know that um, some states actually have really interactive um, other data dashboards. I believe it's Maryland has all of their use of force and stop data that's interactive and publicly available. You can really walk through. It actually looks very similar to our statutory database because they're also powered by Power BI. Uh, but you can drill down by county. You can drill down um, on a number of metrics. And so um, that's all the questions that I'm seeing. I know my colleague Amanda has dropped our contact information in the chat. Please feel free to reach out to NCSL. We're really here to serve you and be a resource for you. If you have questions or if you know you have even if you have questions about NCSL and other ways in general, we're always happy to help. I would encourage you to tune in on uh, the subsequent Fridays to learn more about other areas of policy. Um, and also, I know that our state specific breakouts are coming after this, so I would encourage you to join those as well. Um, and with that, we will wrap up a little bit early and give you some time back in your day. Hopefully that gives you time for a quick break before we see you in those state breakouts. So thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you to my colleagues, Susan and Zach for your expertise as always on this area of the law. Take care.